Section three of Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. The Operation, Part One. Yes, I think that might hang a day longer. I can finish up the mince for my lunch, and you must do something with the turkey legs for dinner. Let me see, and there's fish today, and then, well, suppose you make a savory. Master don't care for savories, ma'am. A sweet, then, I don't care. And that's all, I think. Mrs. Jo Mardell, in her neat morning shirt, coquettishly finished with a man-like tie, and the severity of her attire much modified by the bows and loops of waved hair that crowned her head, turned and was about to leave the dark basement of the little house in Kiramir Street, West Kensington, when a door in the upper regions banged. "'There, he's off, and I wanted a check. Mrs. Mardell observed with mild irritation. She glanced at the kitchen clock with a degree of confidence she did not place in the elegant timekeeper, cased in jewels, that hung on the front of her shirt. "'Why, it's only half-past ten. "'Master's early gone this morning,' said the cook. "'Gladys took his breakfast up only ten minutes ago.' She paused, then, summoning her courage, she asked, "'Ma'am, are people usually buried on Christmas Day?' "'Why, you silly woman, it depends on what day they die. "'Who's been dying?' "'I'll swear,' said the woman eagerly, "'that I saw a corpse being carried down the steps of number 13 "'just over the street opposite nearly a week ago, "'and I reckon it back Christmas Day. "'It's been worrying me ever since. "'Yes, I saw the mourners and hearse and feathers and all done quite proper. "'I was looking out of the front staircase window. "'Neglecting your work, Vance, serves you right.' You saw Whiteley's sail-cart, perhaps. You were looking sideways through the red panes, and glass, you know, refracts oddly. Who lives at number thirteen? Oddly enough, mum, I don't know, though I mostly could tell you the names of everybody in the street. I might ask one of the tradespeople, should I? Yes, do, if you like. Brr! She shivered affectedly, strong in the pride of her health and good looks. It seems a cold time to choose to be put into the ground. One would sooner be cremated this weather. Holding up her crisp, befrilled skirts, the second wife of Joseph Mardell, the popular comic actor, who was just now drawing crowds to his Christmas extravaganza at the quality, made her way up from the dark basement to the abodes of light above. Noiselessly she let fall behind her that swing door at the top of the staircase, which effectively divided the world of society from its service, and exchanged stone and oilcloth for soft carpets and silken curtains. It was a very pretty little house, her house. She admitted Joe into it, her husband-lover Joe. She had managed to keep him her lover. All wives should. She glanced as she passed by at the hat-stand in the hall. Joe had stupidly gone without his fur coat, though it was freezing. Or was it that it needed a stitch? How careless of Gladys! He had left his big umbrella, too, for there it bulged in the rack, beside her own delicate silver-topped one. Careless Joe, willing enough to ignore the mere physical claims of the self he morally bowed to. Moreover, he forced everyone else to do so likewise. He must have his own way, and brooked no check where his mental desires were concerned. It was perhaps the secret of his sway over men, and women. She thought of him, Joseph Mardell, the greatly sought after, and hers, with complacent affection, glancing up conscientiously at the branch of mistletoe which was entwined with the square glass lamp that hung over the front door. Joe had passionately kissed her under the mystic bough a week ago, for luck on the first night of the successful peace. And luck had come, and seemingly remained with them. The booking was splendid and they were rehearsing a more serious play that was to follow the Christmas jollity. Joe was so busy he didn't know where to turn for a spare five minutes. She did not complain, for if things went on like this, they would be able to move out of West Kensington, where you couldn't get a smart parlour-maid to stop with you. Gladys and her fingernails was a sore trial. She entered the dining-room, and her eyes sought the sideboard. Ah, Joe had had some sense, after all, and had remembered to refresh the inner man before leaving, as the violated Tantalus betokened. He lay in bed late, he rarely breakfasted, 
and never with her she rose at eight on principle she could not afford to keep actors hours and ruin her complexion she stood pensively by the small piece of sheraton furniture before she opened a drawer and took out of it what she had come to seek last night's oranges and apples beamed there on a pretty dish joe's cigarette boxes flung about needed tidying up the presentation silver bowl given to joe by his fellow actors on the occasion of his first marriage shone in the centre with dignified lustre they had chosen something quite different to present to him as a memento of his second venture that was in her room right now the bowl had a dwarf fern in it now but sometimes it ran over with punch or was packed with roses another use was contemplated for it if joe and she were to have a baby which sadly enough did not seem likely the bowl would be used for the christening mrs bardell took a pretty little checker duster out of a drawer and went upstairs to her drawing-room on the first floor she carefully picked up an iridescent bead off the carpet the spoil of the dress she had worn last night and placed it on an ash-tray she then proceeded to rub up the several minute objects on her silver table wishing heartily that she could afford to have them lacquered and thus dispense with her daily task so occupied she looked wholly pretty and half domestic a little sobrettish like those neat aproned maids who flutter early about a stage scene and usher in and lay the tables for tragedy there was no harm in florence mardell she was a smart novel reading sandown and ranelagh going woman easily dressed easily amused a little detached perhaps in her interests and careless of the more serious issues of life but quite willing to simulate and assume social crazes as they came up she played a good game of bridge she glanced at the deep reviews as well as the windsor and pearson's and improved her mind on the slightest opportunity you could always get her for a subscription lecture of sorts and she quite approved of female suffrage without however actively concerning herself in its propaganda she never fagged she was always beautifully dressed in a severish strapped mock manly style and could wear successfully the very largest hats when they came in she had been the widow of an officer and had lived at wimbledon in a big dull house standing in its own grounds she had first set eyes on joe mardell playing a strong macheath in the beggar's opera to the most ineffective polly peachum of julia fitzgerald miss fitzgerald was his wife had she but known it it might have made a difference but very likely it would not have then and there she had fallen in love with the actor across the footlights impulsively violently madly and she had not rested being of an acquisitive pugnacious predatory habit of mind until she had persuaded a journalistic friend of hers and his to bring about an introduction with her effective crown of real golden hair waved and curled in extremis her clean fresh suburbanity she had fascinated macheath he was known to be weak volage and full of moods florence was on the contrary strong and pertinacious she had taken him in a mood and let her love profit by it with fond remorselessness she had driven him to drive his wife to divorce him all this she had compassed in her own calm detached way as if unconscious of the larger issues she was stirring another woman's happiness a man's honour and an actor's art for joe was a genius and recognized to be one in spite of some people said because of his strange limitations a little man almost a dwarf he could play the burly falstaff and the courtly byron he could write articles in the reviews he could hold supper-tables in a roar julia mardell's happiness had been sacrificed for she adored and was known to adore her husband to oblige him she had condescended to make use of some of the more complicated and recondite cogs of the machinery of the english law of divorce and had tamely surrendered without humiliating him one of the most fascinating men of the day to another woman yet julia was quite as good-looking as florence if in a different style she was the full-souled full-breasted 
large-eyed junoesque female type and only undertook the playing of a minx like polly peachum to suit joe such a majestic walk as hers such dark swimming eyes were of no avail to the actress who aspired to play one of the wayward mistresses of the highwayman it was the measure of julia's love and her power of self-abnegation joe was prepared to take the whole play on his shoulders only he must have a sympathetic woman to act with he did find julia sympathetic in those days when he loved her and before the pretty widow from wimbledon had leaned out of her box and shaken her golden locks at him then one day the two women met matters were arranged joe susceptible weak hustled and busy succumbed lawyers acted for him julia was compliant florence keen joe worked on and was divorced while rehearsing a new play he himself never knew how it all happened there was a large signed photograph of julia in joe's study now standing unframed concave and dusty on the mantelpiece joe had not dared or cared to give it a more polite or permanent abiding place indeed florence had had some thoughts of removing it from its even so humble position her friends wondered how she could possibly bear to have it there for joe to see every day but she was capricious one never knew how she would take things it was their expressed opinion which perhaps induced her to let it stay curled up and drooping slavishly as time went on and the dust and heat of the fire brought its proud head low florence bore julia no grudge she should think not indeed julia had been very good about it had made no difficulties but on the contrary had smoothed and made easy the path of divorce for the man she loved that is if she really did care for joe she had been so terribly callous in her interviews so full of zeal to give him his freedom it was hardly human so the woman who had profited by her action thought and certainly not very womanly florence could not imagine herself allowing a cold business-like lawyer to dictate her a letter bidding joe come back to her herewith a summons intended of course for ultimate publication it disgusted florence this horrible business of suing for restitution of conjugal rights julia's formal petition was refused by joe in another cold letter equally intended for publication florence had actually read the two inhuman missives printed together in the daily paper divorce had followed in due course oh you tamely died yes little frivolous florence who had never read tennyson would have taken the advice of the egyptian and would have clung to fulvia's waist and thrust the dagger through her side she was a true woman like cleopatra and knew that the elemental passions once raised must have full mastery a man all to oneself or nothing that was her philosophy the feelings of the man in question the state of his affections no matter florence did not see herself considering them or taking any deadly sex insult lying down she considered that julia's poor spiritedness did really verge on meanness she had accepted money from joe an allowance to enable her to leave the stage report said that she had grown stout report said that she had taken to drink lies probably so generous florence said nobody in florence's world knew anything about julia excepting miss walton who had introduced them and though the two women had continued their intimacy it was with the tacit agreement that the name of julia should not be mentioned between them there were plenty of other subjects to talk about miss walton was like everybody else more than half in love with joe funny how they all were rather nice for joe's wife since joe did not bother with any of them mrs mardell after having polished the silver diligently turned her attention to the room she ordered the chairs according to some abstruse social system of her own and flicked her duster about freely here and there she did not feel very fit rather queer on the contrary all overish she could not have told you what it was 
but she was mysteriously conscious of something excessive something outrageous like severe pain in wait for her she seemed to apprehend its nearness instinctively as a patient seated in the dentist's chair watches the eminent practitioner's feet moving and is aware in all his sensitive enamel of the imminent grinding of the file that has been set going perhaps it was the long-continued strain of the cold that was affecting her the frost had lasted since before christmas and had been very severe she paused the little clock on the mantelpiece tinkled half past eleven supposing she were to give herself a slight moral fillip go upstairs and try on her new dress and see how it fitted after having been back twice she was sure in this way to obtain a sensation pleasurable or otherwise she mounted another flight feeling every step to be an effort she lit the gas stove in her room and dismissed the dilatory housemaid whom she found on her knees examining the pattern of the carpet then she dragged a tall cheval glass into position having due regards to unbecoming cross lights and undressed her white handsome shoulders appeared she looked ten times prettier than she had done in the severe morning shirt and tie and she knew it she stood for a few minutes before the mirror complacently admiring herself and in no hurry to don the heavily trimmed corsage that awaited her verdict it lay beside her half in and half out of the flowered cardboard box interleaved with tissue paper and with intersecting lines of tape winding it into its cage her eyes rested on it with feminine appreciation of the elaborate building of the silk lining with its white bone cases crossing and recrossing the back of it and the high collar which was to fit in under the very lobe of the ear still she deferred the pleasing moment of assumption standing still and preening herself soft lappets of valenciennes lace flowering out as a frame to the pink skin suddenly taken by surprise without a cry or a moan she cowered and was bent bent nearly double agonizing pangs shot through the framework of her body her eyes were glassed over with tears and through them she stared out at the world bewildered peering to see from which point the next arrow of dolor would come it came again without fail it came again this time no stabbing thrust but a sword driving delving laboriously through her vitals in a lingering painstaking manner she was by now prepared and well frightened and she groaned aloud her breasts rose and came together as in some strange health exercise under the laces and ribbons my god was it was the silver bowl downstairs going to be used at last no it could not be the thought was dismissed as soon as it formed a chill on the liver the extreme cold what a fool she was to prance about like a peacock in front of a glass for half an hour half dressed what else could she expect that silly stove gave no heat she gathered to her a dressing-gown that lay near and sat still cowering a long pause she could not think but she received no physical intimation of the recurrence of her agony five minutes later she boldly rose defying it and tore the new dress out of its rustling ward without stopping to untie the tapes that controlled it with a screech of tissue paper it yielded into her hands and she put it on then she laughed the pain was forgotten she wriggled about happily yes it still catches me just there they must have it back i'll go to madame about it on let me see tuesday taking the precaution of putting her arms properly into the warm dressing jacket this time she wrapped the dress up again tied the white tapes across it put the lid on firmly and with the little stylograph joe had given her methodically scored out her own name from the label thus substituting that of the dressmaker printed all over the box the exertion slight as it was roused again the smouldering fire of pain she sat down helplessly on her bed giving herself up to it her eyes were like those of a dumb animal in a death anguish as she stared across at her reflection of her already distorted features in the glass rolling to and fro she grasped and relaxed alternately the fronts of her peignoir 
knotted feverishly in her palm what the devil is it she murmured i feel as if my life was going she did not think of calling anyone vance or gladys the impotent housemaid no one could help her she was but a poor human passageway for these relentless throes that passed juggernaut like through her shrinking body it was like a garden roller when it was not like many scythes set on one axle turning twisting inside her what had she ever done to suffer so no child of joe's could be so cruel and tear its mother thus nay she had not conceived unless it was some monstrous impious growth that was rending her and would not soften or relax till it killed her she really thought she was going to die presently when all was quiet again in the tortured battleground of her body she rose and pushed her hand through her bows of wavy hair and flung it back hideously and crossed the room apologetically almost for fear of provoking a recurrence of the horror she dragged herself downstairs and to the swing door at the head of the kitchen stairs she now felt the need of a confidant she must tell some one the housemaid was too young vance was fairly motherly pushing open the door she sat down on the top step with her peignoir gathered round her and stretching out her legs allowed them to hang over into the dark abyss of vance's domain by the time she felt able to raise her voice and call vance she had decided not to confide in her the cook would immediately think things and she wanted no fuss it was not that either she only wished it was for then there would at least be some compensation in baby fingers to smooth pain away in response to her weak summons the cook appeared at the foot of the stairs even in the dim penumbra of a london basement a person unpreoccupied by her own symptoms would have realized at once that vance was discomposed agitated in some unusual way her cap was hanging by one hairpin her flowery arms were nervously rubbing one against the other but mrs mardell noticed nothing in other people to-day she addressed vance slowly and deliberately vance please i want you to make me a nice cup of tea at once i shall not be able to eat any lunch i think i'll wait till six and have something with mr mardell ain't you feelin well mum asked the cook spiritlessly no not very a little all overish it will be nothing only i don't feel like eating a solid meal nor i can't say i feel like cookin it vance observed bitterly i'm that upset i've been across and asked asked what inquired mrs mardell warily about the funeral that i saw with my own eyes leaving that house on christmas day it's not natural i said to go gettin buried on christmas day mrs mardell interposed patiently you don't mean to say you went and asked at the house if they'd had any one die there really vance it's no good saying that now mum i had to know and it's only a nursing home not a private house so i've done no harm and the woman's voice grew low and hoarse nobody ain't died there not yet that's all she put her apron to her face good gracious vance mrs mardell cried tell me more about it mum they've only got one patient there a lady she was going on all right but she had a relapse this morning just about half past eleven their cook said it was she had an operation three weeks ago and no good and it's got to be done all over again this afternoon at two o'clock and they can't tell as it'll be successful this time well my good woman don't you worry let's hope that the lady will get over it people do you know or there would be an end of nursing homes i really feel so poorly myself that i can't get up much sympathy with other people's aches and pains be quick and put the kettle on or is it boiling already yes mum you shall have it in a minute mum you may not believe me but i seen a proper funeral and the hearse waiting and the corpse carried out and down those steps and the bearers with crape on their hats and so attentive and one of them was no bigger than master i thought of master the moment i saw him and she was a big woman for she took a big coffin you are settling that it's the woman who's lying ill there now who has got to die i see what's her name i asked 
but the girl didn't know only that she was an actress mrs mardell gathered in her legs decisively come now vance don't stand there gossiping and unhinging yourself with fancies get me my cup of tea i shall be all right i expect when once i have had something warm bring it to my room i shall lie down a bit i think she rose to her feet closed the swing door dismissing vance and her dreary soothsaying vision and passed upstairs her day was spoilt the pain did not seem to be going to recur luckily but the deadly feeling of uneasiness which had succeeded it certainly increased her legs were weak and could hardly carry her people who have seen an apparition are said to feel just so but as she reflected it was vance not she who had seen the ghost she paused halfway up the stairs to look out of the window on the first landing whence vance declared she had watched the lugubrious tableau mrs mardell had never gone in for knowing her neighbours it was wiser not or else she would have been aware of the industry that was carried on at number thirteen a red brick sham artistic villa just like her own house like every other house in the street she could only make it out by pressing her face against the window and then she only saw it aslant and red through the vicious stained glass that occupied that particular pane eight steps led up to the front door of it as eight steps led up to hers surely it was awkward for the incoming patients many of them presumably too ill to walk she wondered what sort of cases they took there it would depend julia she had heard had grown very fat at thirty that indicated something abnormal in a youngish woman something that had to be removed generally she laughed she wondered why she laughed your tea mum said vance suddenly at her elbow i thought i would bring it up to you myself mrs mardell was a little ashamed that vance should discover her staring out of the window at the scene of her absurd cock-and-bull story she turned and coldly bade the cook precede her to her bedroom with the tea vance accepted the rebuff meekly she looked cowed and thoroughly upset and as if no merely domestic trifle could affect her now broken to tragic issues as she had been the tea as mrs mardell had expected revived her and enabled her to lay a nice little plan for a quiet afternoon indoors she proposed to telephone for miss walton to come and sit with her for a bit she needed something or somebody to pick her up of course there was charlie bligh a nice boy whom both she and joe liked she might telephone him to come and take her out to dine as he often did but no she wasn't looking carlton form it wouldn't be fair to charlie to ask him to take out anything that wasn't gay and smart besides it would be rather mean to leave joe to eat his dinner all alone when she had not even said good morning to him she had often left him for dinner of course and he had never thought of objecting verbally at least but just now that he was so busy and overworked she felt sure that he would like her sitting beside him at his dinner even though she could eat nothing she saw herself delicately invalidish in her soft draperies picking at some grapes she felt mysteriously drawn to joe dear joe who was working for her now who never attempted to control her social movements who took what she gave him and was always as ready to flirt with her as if he were not married to her she had managed joe so well no she wouldn't leave joe to-night but get miss walton who would surely stay with her till joe returned about half-past five as usual miss walton over the telephone signified her willingness to come and have a good chat mrs mardell made up her mind to take things easy she was really unwell she had eaten nothing since breakfast she felt empty shaken swelled and sore she could not have got her exquisitely adjusted corsets on if she had tried or endured the pressure of them round her body a tea-gown was clearly indicated she assumed one and a little lace cap that went well with it sighing deeply she lay down on the rose-coloured chintz sofa in the drawing-room shaded by a soft standard lamp breathing timorously existing furtively unnoticed she hoped it would pass her by this brooding eagle of pain waiting to tear her she had brought her jewel-case downstairs with her and idly toyed with her trinkets there were three trays lined with velvet they twinkled with precious stones 
she took every piece in order and examined them slowly seriously all the while her fingers seemed to know that down at the bottom of the box lay their real objective a thin crumpled tousled letter folded small and turning up at the corners florence mardell had received it a few days after her marriage and although it was only a letter from a woman had forborne to show it to her husband the letter was not actually malicious or even disagreeable but it had dismayed her and shocked her she had kept it in case julia should ever choose to lay aside her extraordinary tolerance and become human again she read it over now to remind her of what it contained indeed she had intended to do so when she fetched the box the by-play with the jewellery was only a blind self-deceiving a sop to her superficial consciousness now it is all over my strivings have not been in vain and joe passes from me to you you must not mind my writing you florence i think that on the whole you will prefer to know what i feel and that the woman you have supplanted is not your enemy joe loves you and as the woman joe loves you cannot be abhorrent to me convention forbids me to be your personal friend your feeling possibly and perhaps my own for i am but a woman after all and the open wound that was left in my life when joe was torn from my side would be chafed and kept raw by the sight of him merged now in your life yes it is better so i cannot will not see him either though joe is not conventional joe is nothing that is not splendid i did i do love him so passionately that i cannot hate you florence as you see you are the fair new temple in which he worships the spirit of beauty and love and life the law has clanged the door too none may dare to interrupt the litany he prays there on his knees god bless you but oh my dear keep him there never undress the altar no more shifting for joe if we women can help it he is a great man he must be treated like a great man these upheavals are bad for him from every point of view so be practical as well as passionate and condescend to learn from me who failed how not to lose him only approximately can you learn for the wind of art blows its children where it listeth you know what an artist he is and all artists are nothing but divine children but florence on your life don't treat him as one don't let yourself mother him as i did and be mad enough to sink the mistress in the sister the friend even that was my fatal mistake i abstracted my sexual self till i became at last the caterer for his mere physical welfare the confidant of his passing flirtations oh the bitterness of those smothered confessions those despairing returns of him broken marred and dispirited to the one who surely loved him do this my dear as i did and then one day he'll come to you as he came to me and put his head on your knee and ask you to divorce him so you're both ruined in your several ways he cannot go through it a second time now listen you must i know i would have you always a little inaccessible puzzling capricious even i would ask you to dare to appear selfish if you can manage it preserve your delicate tangibility punish any slight infringement of your rules close your door to him at night when he has been naughty or careless what it will cost you but it is the right way you have an enormous pull by not acting with him believe me one gets so common so cheap to a man when he is used to knocking one about all over the stage as catherine say or insulting one as nancy stay away from the theatre and accept as many dinners without him as you can although there isn't the very slightest chance of his losing you don't let him feel as convinced of that as you are yourself you see what i mean don't you florence i heard you were very clever as well as a little frivolous i have thought all this out in many sleepless nights for your benefit and his yes it is joe that i am thinking of and shall think of till i die and so of you too oh don't for goodness sake be offended by this letter 
or take a dislike to me, for whether you like it or not, you will never be quite free of me any more. Thought, strong thought, does permeate matter, and finds itself able to overthrow its mere material resistance. I have proved it, no matter how. I won't weary you with attempted explanations. I should not fancy you were psychic, but be sure that there will be a little of me in all your relations with Joe. I shall have a word in your menage, and you must not let the thought of it make you uncomfortable. Do you suppose I could have let him go so easily if I had not this power to console me? Take it as the slight penalty of kidnapping a man out of the ward of a devoted woman. You see how it is. He comes away, she offers no material or spirited opposition, but he brings inevitably some of her atmosphere along with him. Joe never actually ceased to love me. He only began to love you. I never misconducted myself, funny phrase, so I am still his true and faithful wife, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, and where he is henceforth, in some sort, I am. It cannot be helped. It is a good thing that I am not vindictive and that I don't hate you, since our relation must necessarily be so close. I assure you that it will not inconvenience you, annoy you, or trouble you at all, at least not until the bands of the spirit are loosed in one of these great, bare, soul-stripped, unaccounted-for moments of life that come to all of us sometimes. Then, you know, one can't tell or foresee. The spiritual bonds and relationships assert themselves and enforce attention. I can't quite promise to shield you then to free you from the circle of the charm. But are you so frivolous, Florence? Won't it interest you, awe you, soothe you? Ah, don't fear me, don't hate me, bid your flesh comply with me. I am only the ghost of a wife, a power of love that can't circumscribe itself, even though it would. There is a physical lean between us, undoubtedly. I won't drag it if I can help. I'll try to control. I don't know what I am writing. Something writes for me. But trust me. Julia what a cat said mrs mardell she folded up the letter again and laid it at the bottom of the box it was almost actionable she thought a threatening letter or else the letter of a mad spiritualist utter sentiment impossible rot what would charlie bly or any other daylight person think of it strangely enough she had more or less taken julia's advice it was sensible and thus she supposed germane to her own character she had not mothered joe what woman in her senses would she needed no deserted defeated schemer to hang about her in the spirit to tell her that she knew men as julia with all her preachments had evidently never known them and the result of her wise treatment of joe was that he was devoted to her extraordinarily so for a busy man of course he worked hard, too hard, harder than he had done in Julia's time. It had happened so. Success had brought its own tension and high pressure. He was not, as Julia and her friends might like to suggest, trying to drown the memory of her in a round of forced activities. He was only taking fortune at the flood and making dramatic hay while the sun of critics' favour shone. Not for a moment did he regret the step he had taken— his was an essentially light nature. He never brooded, and he detested heroics. The writer of that letter, with its tedious mixture of sentimentality and preoccupation with material cares, must have bored Joe to death in the days when she had him all to herself and could claim consecutive opportunity for worrying him. And now, of course, a masterpiece of supreme tactlessness, like all failures, she turned critic and took on herself to give good advice. Florence Mardell laughed. The reading of the letter had acted as even a better Philip than the trying on of the dress, and had nearly made her angry. I suppose, she tossed her little crowned head, that it is very good of her to give me the straight tip, and volunteer to overlook my menage, generally, like a sort of superior lady housekeeper. 
I am not so bad at it myself, thank you. She worked herself up to a sneer. Much obliged, Julia, I'm sure, for haunting me, especially as she appears willing to confine herself merely to bothering the sensible mistress of the house, and doesn't go frightening the servants and making them give up their places. Vance wouldn't stop a minute. Her brow furrowed a little as she remembered the white, frightened face of Vance that morning. It's a fairly cool thing, though, her thought resumed, for one woman to tell another, flat, that she considers herself part of her, because she happens to have adored her husband and does still, I suppose. Man and wife, no, wife and wife, are one flesh. Ha! Ha! It was two o'clock. Her face changed. Arrowy tinglings, growlings as of a chained monster inside her slender frame, punctuated her words. The pain had come again. When Miss Walton came in, she would ask her to ring up a doctor. She could not have dragged herself to the instrument now. End of section three.